Good morning, it's uh, 10 o'clock. Can I uh, say good morning to everybody and welcome you to this meeting of the Eastern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three based area committees of Dorset Council. Our area of remit covers the previous Purbeck District Council and most of the previous East Dorset District Council areas. For the benefit of the public, I'm Councillor Tony Coombs and I'm Chairman of this committee. I'd like to introduce to you the officers who will be supporting us today. Kim Cowell, Principal Planning Officer, James Nitton Trevers, who's one of the Planning Case Officers, Liz Adams, Planning Case Officer, Colin Graham from Dorset Highways, Chelsea Goddard will be reading out the public representations, Phil Crowther is our Solicitor Support today and David Northover is our Committee Support Officer. I would also like to thank all of the officers behind the scenes who are making today's virtual meeting possible. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council has had to put in place measures to enable the Council's decision-making processes to continue whilst keeping safe members of the public. Councillors and Council staff, in accordance with the Government's guidance on social distancing, by applying new regulations for holding committee meetings from remote, remote locations. This meeting is being live streamed to the public and a copy of the recording of the meeting will be available on the website after the meeting. Public participation will take the form of written statements as opposed to public speaking. We will be taking agenda item seven first this morning due to the level of public interest and then follow the agenda as printed. So first of all, uh, David, are there any apologies for absence? No apologies for absence. Thank you very much. I'm now going to do a roll call of the committee just to confirm that everybody is here as we expect. Shane Bartlett, Vice Chairman. Present, Madam Chairman. Alex Brenton. Present, Madam Chairman. Robin Cook. Present, Madam Chairman. Mike Dyer. Present, Madam Chairman. Barry Gorringe. Present, Madam Chairman. Brian Heatley. Good morning, I'm here. David Morgan. Present, Madam Chairman. Julie Robinson. Present, Madam Chairman. David Took. Present, Madam Chairman. And last but not least, Bill Trite. Sorry, two more. Bill Trite. <laughs> Morning, Bill, are you there? And John Worth. Present, Madam Chairman. OK. So, uh, members, I need to ask if there are any declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination on the, today's agenda. Oh, I'm received. OK. Item three on the agenda are the minutes of the last meeting held on the 6th of January 21. Are members happy for me to approve them as a true record and sign them as soon as I can access offices? Agree, Madam Chairman. Agree, Madam Chairman. Agree, Madam Chairman. Yeah. Any dissent? Lovely. Thank you very much. So, public participation. Members of the public have been invited to submit written representations limited to 450 words. Members of Dorset Council who are not members of the committee and who wish to address the committee will also be allowed to speak. All requests have to have been registered with Democratic Services by 8.30 a.m. on last Monday. Are there any representations from the public that do not relate to matters on the agenda today? None. Okay, thank you. So moving on swiftly to the matters under consideration. We have three planning applications before us today. Have there been any requests for deferrals or withdrawals, please? Madam Chairman, Kim Cowell here. Um, a request from officers that item five, application reference 6 2019-656, Crack Lane, Langton, Matravers, um, which is an outline application on a rural exception site for development of eight dwellings six affordable two open markets with details of access and all other matters reserved that that application be deferred in order to update the officer report 
to address the implications of the latest housing delivery figures for the Isle of Purbeck, published on the 2nd of January 2021. Um, um, that office request. Thank you. OK, thank you. So. Um, just to be absolutely clear on that, um, we will not be discussing item five. Uh, background information relating to the planning applications before us today has been available for inspection by members prior to the meeting and that covers consultations, objections and representations as well as the previous East Dorset and Purbeck local plans and the council's related policies. In each case I will invite the planning case officer to introduce their item. Members of the public, planning agents, applicants, town and parish councils have all been invited to make written submissions and these will be read out by Chelsea College, who I need to say has not been involved with the merits of any of the applications, but only in providing technical support. These will be read out in the following order. Public against the application, public in support, the applicant or agent, town or parish council and then local member. Following the public participation section of every item, I will ask officers if there are any salient points that they wish to clarify. I will then ask members if there are any questions or comments to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to comment. In order to run the meeting uh, properly this morning, may I request that members of the committee direct any remarks and questions through the chair and I will invite members to speak in turn. Requests to speak will need to be made via the chat facility. Please keep microphones on mute when you're not speaking to maintain audio quality. At the end of the debate for transparency, I will take the vote by roll call and the vote will be recorded in the minutes. If three or more members make the necessary request. I will also ask members to confirm that they've heard the entire presentation and debate before they cast their vote. So due to the technology, there may be a short gap whilst the presentations are loaded. And the first item we're going to be taking today is item 7, 6, 2020-0281 to erect single storey extensions with pitched roofs and insert three roof lights within the northeast elevation and install a rainwater harvest tank at five Ballard Estate Swanage and on your agenda that's pages 69 to 83. Liz I believe you're going to take us through this one. Thank you Madam Chair. Good morning members. Uh, my name is Liz Adams and I'm going to um, be presenting the two committee items that are before you today. So this first um, item regarding five Ballard Estate comes before members due to objections raised by Swanage Town Council and in the light of the level of local interest and objection to the proposals. Your officer's recommendation is for approval. Uh, if I may just confirm at the start of this presentation, um, the application was advertised appropriately by site notice on the 27th of July last year and by letters to adjoining neighbours. And during the course of the application, amended plans were received and reconsultation with the parish and neighbours was carried out in October. Um, other subsequent amendments were minor and therefore not judged to necessitate further reconsultation. I'm hoping we will move on to the next slide. There we go. So the application lies in the town of Swanage in the former Purbeck area. Uh, Swanage local plan applies to the Swanage parish, which is shown with this blue line here on the slide. And it forms part of the development plan for Purbeck against which applications are to be determined. This plan of Swanage identifies the areas of local, um, distinctive local character, I should say, in blue. So we see them here. Um, and that includes Ballard Down. Policy STCD, which is the Swanage Townscape Character and Development Policy, specifically identifies that new development in these areas should protect and enhance the distinctive local characteristics of the areas. The Ballard Down area is identified as historic bungalow development, uh, which should continue to support single storey development only. Further detail is provided by the character um, Townscape Character Assessment and that's dated September 2012. So Swanage lies within the Dorset area of outstanding natural beauty. 
but this householder proposal will not have any significant impact on the character of the area beyond the immediate vicinity. The application site lies within the Ballard Down area of the settlement and is surrounded by residential properties. Please note that number seven shown here uh, was prior to its redevelopment. So the land on which the Ballard estate is located was used during the First World War as the location for military barracks and it featured single storey Canadian timber huts. The precise linear layout that you can see here, uh, typical of army barracks, has since evolved with replacement dwellings in the western part of the area particularly. The character assessment notes that buildings are generally consistent in scale and form, reflecting their origin as converted barrack huts. But it also notes that buildings in Ballard Lee, to this side, uh, provide an exception as their replacement or later development. So the following Google aerial images show the application site in the context of the existing development on the Ballard estate. This is the application site. The eastern part of the estate, as you can see, comprises lower buildings, often with apex form, that have replaced the garrison buildings. The western part of the estate uh, comprises later bungalows that have less regimented layout and square of form. They are of a different character. So the variation in plot depth, uh, you can see here is quite a squat and then a longer one. And this means uh, it's not uncharacteristic for dwellings to lie close to the highway within the estate, although number five lies closer than the adjoining properties. This is set back. The three dwellings at uh, number nine Ballardley that you can see here to the north uh, were granted by Purbeck Planning Committee in 2012 and they're on slightly lower ground and they have first floor accommodation within their roofs. This was considered not to harm the character of the area, although it is noted that this was prior to the adoption of Swanage Local Plan in 2017, which places greater emphasis on single storey development. Zooming in, we can see that the nearest neighbours are all bungalows. Uh, the properties are well spaced. Number seven to the north is the closest to the application site. Buildings to the east, these ones here, are outbuildings to the gardens of the dwellings further to the east. So these are the existing elevations and you can see the property is a modest bungalow with unattractive flat roof extensions. Uh, the property has an attic lit by a window, so it's considered unlikely that the roof is used by bats. But an informative note on the decision notice could draw the applicant's attention to their obligations under environmental law. These photographs were taken of the application site from the highway. Um, just so members are aware, this is number seven to the north that we saw just now, and that's approximately 4.5 metres in height, set back about six and a half metres from the highway. You can see here the um, side of sort of front um, flat roof extension that projects further forward and is approximately a metre from the highway. This is the side wall which screens the side of the property. You can see again the flat roof extension here projecting out and at the moment the front of the property is this elevation here. Um, yeah. The proposal is to add extensions to the property. So the northeast elevation uh, would have this sort of porch extension here and this is to become the principal elevation. The northwest elevation is to be squared off and the south uh, east elevation facing the road is also to be extended by two metres forward. And there you can see that's the flat roof, um, it's the flat roof element at the moment, which is retained. Overall, the extensions represent about 28% increase on the existing footprint and will create a more rectangular form. The plans clarify that the proposed loft space will be boarded in the same manner as the existing, which is served by the one roof light you can see there. And the proposal will increase the volume of the roof and consequently the loft space. The application doesn't propose use of the loft as living accommodation. The extensions to the dwellings will be accompanied by rationalising the new hipped roof over the enlarged floor plan. Uh, so a lower hipped roof is to be added to the, this existing flat roof element joining the road to a height of 4.5 metres, which is equivalent to that at number seven. And um, shallow gable elements are to be attached to the new front of the property facing number seven and the rear, which faces numbers one and three. So the blue dashed line indicates the existing roof form. 
The proposed height of the ridge line is to remain at just over six metres, which is shown to be achieved by a reduced um, pitch of the roof. There's um, no increase in height proposed, and with the exception of the modest gables, the roofs will all slope away from the, the road and from neighbouring properties, which will mitigate the impact of the increased bulk. The property is positioned close to the northern boundary, shared with number seven, as we said before. Um, the distance is identified here approximate. Um, there is a new outbuilding to the east, which isn't shown on the plan, but we will see it in photos shortly. Um, dwellings to the east and west lie approximately 35 metres distance, building to building from number five, so no harm is anticipated. The three roof lights shown here proposed to serve the attic space face number seven. Now, as the attic is large enough to be converted to living accommodation in the future without the need for planning permission, it is considered necessary and reasonable to impose a condition requiring that the roof lights are obscure glazed and fixed shut. Um, that's condition five on the report. And another condition is also proposed to remove permitted development rights of further windows, that's condition six. These are considered to avoid uh, potential for overlooking of number seven and ensure that the relationship is acceptable and in accordance with policy D of the Perfect Local Plan. This plan also shows the proposal uh, rainwater harvesting tank. Um, this would be used to store rainwater for uses such as flushing toilets or irrigating the garden. Um, the proposal is for limited extensions to the existing dwellings, so um, the increase in um, runoff isn't anticipated to be very high, but um, because of the location close to the coast, it's proposed that a condition be imposed on any grant of permission to secure additional drainage details. Uh, those would be to alleviate possible risks of flooding and coastal instability. Uh, this is, um, these are the plans from application 2020-0086, which was refused in April 2020. Um, these were judged um, to result in a cumulative bulk they included, you can see here, more of an apex roof form um, and would have formed a sort of chalet style dwelling. And it was considered that that would be harmful to the character of the area. In addition, the rear gable window was considered to result in harmful overlooking of number seven. The revised proposal is considered to overcome these concerns. Although the hipped roof element that you can see here over the flat roof facing the road is unchanged, the main roof is now fully hipped and that will draw the bulk back from the road and there are no longer any gable windows. Swanage Town Council has objected to the application. They've raised concern that the submitted plans lack detail. Uh, since their objection was raised, amended plans have been received that now show the extent of the attic, um, how it will be enlarged. Um, and as the ridge height is not increasing and the property is angled um, away from the highway, uh, further information such as a street scene has not been considered necessary to enable full assessment in this case. And the Town Council was also concerned about the potential adverse impact on neighbouring amenity, but it's not considered that the enlarged building would appear overbearing and the potential for overlooking from windows serving the attic can be avoided by the imposition of conditions. Further concerns were raised that the development is two-storey property and that this would have an adverse impact on the street scene and be contrary to the Swanage Local Plan Policy STCD. Um, your officers do not agree with this assessment. We consider that the proposal seeks extensions that rationalise previous enlargements and brings them under a larger roof, but that this will not result in any demonstrable harm to the character of the area. Um, notwithstanding the three roof lights, the dwelling will retain a single storey form with an unchanged ridge height, so it's not considered that this conflicts with the policy STCD. Um, the Town Council also noted um, that there had been no consultation with neighbours prior to the application being submitted, and as you'll appreciate, this is not a matter over which the Council has any jurisdiction and therefore it's not a material planning consideration. Uh, additional objections raised by third parties um, included concerns about impacts on drainage of the area. As previously mentioned, it's reasonable to secure details of surface water management, um, but the other services would be a matter for building control and fall outside of the planning remit. Loss of views are not a material planning consideration, and the visual impact of the proposed extensions within the street scene is considered acceptable. Covenants which restrict development to single storey are again a separate matter from planning control and therefore not material. 
Now, mindful that you won't have been able to visit the site during COVID, so the next few slides are to provide context. I'll run through them relatively swiftly. But this, uh, we're starting here at the entrance to the estate, and you can see the low bungalow buildings. So I've got a little arrow um, moving along the plan to show you where we're, where we're looking, roughly. This is the fork with Ballard Lee heading off to the north there, and then the road towards the sea is off to the right of, out of the shot. This is heading towards the coast, and you can see the low form of the, um, the former garrison buildings where they've been um, some of them have been redeveloped, some of them have just been um, improved. Uh, this is the post office, which is to the south of the highway here. And then looking up the street in the eastern part of the estate, you can see um, the regimented form um, of the buildings that have replaced the military accommodation. Coming back to the junction and looking north up Ballard Lee, you can see at number 11 here on the right. And then we've got number three and then number five, which is the application site, which are, we think, probably 1930s bungalows. So they're a different character to the um, east of the estate. Further up the road here again, on, here's the application site on the left. And then you come to number seven, which is newly developed. A bit further up, we see these later bungalows here and the more modern form of these properties which have higher ridges than we saw back in the eastern part of the estate. These are the chalet dwellings at the north of Ballard Lee on lower land. As you can see, um, the townscape character assessment notes that some bungalows in the area have roof lights and a couple have dormers, although these are generally not readily apparent. Then looking south, for up the hill as it were, it's quite a gradual hill. Uh, you can make out the roof number seven there and the new uh, 4.5 metre high pitch roof on the existing flat roof element would be seen in the context of this other development. Be coming in here. Uh, returning to the immediate context of the application site, we can see that the dwelling is considered to be sufficiently separated from others, other uh, dwellings, that the additional bulk can be accommodated without harm. Um, this is number three to the south here, and these are the outbuildings that are opposite the site on these plots. And the plot size and siting um, of the application site is such that the development is not considered to harm the character of the area. Um, the property, as I said, lies in the western part of the Ballard Downs area, where dwellings are more substantial and have a different character to those on the main estate, where the ridges are lower and the layout more regimented. So here we just remind her again of what's being proposed. And in conclusion, uh, your officers have been mindful that policy STCD seeks to protect the low single storey form of development within the Ballard Downs area. Whilst the proposal will create a larger attic, it will not increase the height of the existing bungalow and will retain a hipped form. And your officers consider that the development will not appear incongruous or harmful to the character of the area. Subject to conditions to control materials, the windows at first floor level need to be controlled and drainage as set out on pages 79 and 80 of your report. The proposal is found to be acceptable and approval is therefore recommended. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that really detailed presentation. I'm going to move on now to the public representations. Uh, Chelsea, I understand we have four representations this morning as well as local members. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so the first uh, comment is from Simon Groves, who objects. Please, will you object to this proposal for number five Ballard Estate? As residents, we have received four plan applications since August 2019. Each one slightly different, but what unites them is the overwhelming rejection of the designs by the local residents. We must say we have struggled with communication with the developer. We live in a historic bungalow estate of distinctive local character recognised by the policy STCD of the Swanage Local Plan, which recommends single storey development only. The character of the estate is one of low impact properties, but somehow manages a feeling of spaciousness. Number five sits in an elevated position on the estate. We think this building proposal is too large in scale and mass. The roof would double in size and its centre of gravity would move closer to the road, such that it would dominate the street scene and adversely affect views. 
It had become the second largest building on the estate by a significant amount, and the largest, the old post office and stores, is really a house of the granny annex. We regret that the relationship of this proposed design with nearby buildings and within the locality has always been missing in the drawings, but not for want of asking. The proposed bridge would be 2.1 metres higher than a neighbour's corresponding roof. The buildings are as close as seven metres apart. These two roofs are a similar offset from the road, but number five would overpower this relationship. The flat roofed build out at the front of the building is one metre from the road, whereas the front of the adjacent four buildings are seven metres from the road, and so the relationship also is lost here. Increasing the height by adding a hipped roof to this build out would create a prominent and harmful impact in the street scene. We are sorry, but we cannot agree that this building is acceptable to the character and appearance of the local area. These so called extensions and alterations would mean the loss of 50% of the walls, 80% of the windows, and all of the roof. So there could be a way of reducing the harm the masses would do. For example, the main ridge height could be reduced to lower the impact of bulk because height is not required for loft space. Also, a simpler, more symmetrical design is possible if the incongruous build out at the front would be incorporated into the main footprint. If policy STCD is disregarded, the precedent of replacing modest roofs with enlarged first floor roofs to gain accommodation may attract the wrong type of architecture in the sensitive area. Thank you for listening. The next comment is from Kat Burdett from Ken Park Plan Consultants on behalf of the Ballard Estate Company. Thank you for this opportunity to make a representation to you. I'm speaking on behalf of the Ballard Estate Company Limited, who strongly object to this development. We are very disappointed that the officer's recommendation is one of approval. We are astonished that there is such limited analysis and understanding of the impact of the development upon the character of the Ballard Estate. This site is within the area of outstanding natural beauty and within the town's Ballard Estate character area. Local and national planning policies all seek to protect such areas. The most important consideration is the potential impact of the, on the character of the estate. The Council's character appraisal of the Ballard Estate underpins local plan policies within the Swanage and Purbeck local plans, as well as the emerging local plan. It describes the small and compact character of the estate bungalows. This originated as an army camp laid out in the First World War. Bungalows generally have simple, shallow pitched roofs. The appraisal identifies the risks of loss of character through change, in particular with the introduction of development of two storeys in height. Number five, Ballard Estate is a typical estate bungalow, very close to the estate road and to neighbouring properties. As an original central section with fully hit pitched roof and extended elements, almost abutting the front boundary of the estate road. The existing extended parts have flat roofs, all much lower than the main part of the house. To add a new roof over an ex all existing elements, together with extensions, with a considerable bulk proposed, would certainly create a dominant and overbearing impact on this particular site. The roof proposed is of sufficient height and bulk to allow accommodation within the roof space. The last application refused for this site found the addition of a pitched roof over the existing single storey element alongside the road would be unacceptable. The same feature is proposed again as part of a new long roof that would be larger than all on the estate except the former estate at post office and stores at number four. A more modest roof treatment with a low ridge for extended elements would be significantly more appropriate and would guard against the loss of character that the council's policies and character appraisal seek to prevent. This has been achieved when on other sites within the estate. We urge councillors to refuse this application and assist in maintaining the important characters of this historic First World War estate. The next comment is from Linda and Vaughan Steele. Our property, number seven, lies immediately next to number five. We obtained plan permission in 2018 to replace the previous bungalow with a single storey property after a planning review in which planning policies and guidance had to be followed. Planning officers now recommend approval for our immediate neighbours to almost completely redevelop their property without those same policies and guidance being followed. Half the walls and most of the windows of number five are to be removed and replaced. The entire roof we removed and replaced by a much larger repositioned one with far greater ridge length and width. We worked with the planners in a single application. We struggle to understand why there have been four applications to number five. The planning rules exist for a reason and should be applied consistently and fairly. Our design took great care to respect the character of the neighbourhood and the style of our neighbours, including roof height and building lines. Ours is a modern design, along with other recent developments, such as numbers 17 and 39. It's harmonious with the estate and sympathetic to the character. Number five sits on the edge of its site where the ground slopes northwards. It's very close to the road in a prominent position on the estate. 
thus it is in a dominating position on the street scene and over our property. Any changes to the roof line or to the mass and bulk of the roof, which already sits well above its neighbours, including us, adds to this dominance affecting our immunity. Government policy places increased emphasis on good design. We see ways in which number five could be sympath sympathetically redeveloped in a manner that, as we do, had to do, respects local plans and guidance and provides a harmonious relationship with its neighbours. The main reason for the mass and bulk of the roof and its height and length is to use the roof space as a very large loft. A significant concern is the potential use of the loft space on the plan, shown on the plan placed on the website on 2nd of February 2021 as habitable space. Is the council able to require that this loft can only be used for storage purposes and not as habitable space? Although the report proposes conditions on the roof lights and openings, we have doubts about their effectiveness. Will they be enforced with staff and budget restrictions? Maybe a fresh application may be made to vary or remove the conditions. After all, different standards appear to have been applied to our respective re redevelopments and only a couple of years apart. We ask that you refuse the application. The final comments from the applicant, Barry and Janet Morehouse. There have been a considerable number of objections to our plans, generally referring to making our properties two-storey. We are certainly not making our property two-storey and have also confirmed to the Ballard Estate Company that is its intention for it to remain as a bungalow. There have been 18 neighbour objections from the estate, which equates to 35% of the residents. Two properties have sent in two objections. On the other perspective, 65% have not objected. We have taken on board many comments raised by our neighbours, the Ballard Estate Company, and have also listened carefully to the plan officer in trying to improve the overall appearance of our bungalow and comply with permitted planning policies. From our first application, we have removed gable ends, we have reduced the overall mass of the roof by at least 20% and have removed windows from the gables. Also, a rainwater harvest system has been introduced, whereupon we will be recycling rainwater. We do not consider that we are being radical in any way and are sympathetically trying to remove the unsightly and ugly flat roofs from either end, keeping it in character with the rest of the dwelling. The roof height is not being raised, it is to remain the same. We have a tired, dated and a non-energy efficient property. We would like to update our bungalow and also improve its insulation properties. We do not believe any of this would ruin the street scene. We believe it would improve it. We also have our front door in the rear garden, which is unusual and is not practical. Trying to rectify these issues would greatly improve the overall experience, appearance of our property and its layout. We do not believe our proposals will impose on any of our neighbours. We fully support and understand the desire of the estate and Swanage Town Council not to have two-storey dwellings and not to be too radical and to keep them in line with the STCD. Albeit, this, be, this has been contravened on the, web, on the estate in many instance, instances. When the Swanage Townscape character assessment was done in 2007 and 8, there was mixed feedback by the residents on the character of the Ballard Estate. Some viewed the estate with strong character and a distinctive street scene, while others saw it as a commonplace development with a very little sense of place or local identity. We believe this remains the same today and any improvement would greatly enhance the estate rather than leave it as it is. We'd like to think we have met all the relevant planning requirements and that today's committee would find the current application to be satisfactory. Thank you, Madam Chairman. That's all the comments. Thank you very much. Very well delivered. I'm now going to uh, take the ward members in alphabetical order. So the first one is Gary Suttle. Would you like to speak to us this morning, Gary? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, as one of the local Dorset councillors for Swanage, I'll be opposing this application on behalf of the residents uh, who contact me and on behalf of our long-standing planning policy in this location. It is unfortunate that a site visit is not possible as it's difficult to appreciate how much impact this application will have on the surrounding area. And I think if you look at the proposed elevations, which I hope uh, you can see as well as I can, there's been statements that there will be no height increase and yet the northwest elevation shows the previous bungalow with a height uh, increase and so does the southeast elevation. And I think if you look at the southwest elevation and the northeast elevation, you get an, an idea of the impact and the enormity of the proposal. And as the neighbour has said, uh, it is akin <coughs> to a rebuild. Um, so the site was, as I say, a World War I army camp comprised of a number of wooden or barrack type huts, small plots, very narrow roads suitable to traffic in the 1900s. Even when I was a schoolboy walking through this estate, it was pri primar primarily wooden huts used as housing. 
And over the last 50 years, each has been made into permanent brick or other built bungalow. And in pre-74, the then Swanage Urban District Council acknowledged the site as of special interest and to be preserved as one story only. In 74, the planning function became the remit of PDC and the historic mantle of protection for this area was maintained, granting permission for one single story dwelling, dwellings only. And as you'll see from the enormity of these proposed elevations and the fact of the roof lights, it gives every impression to anybody else that this is in fact a two story building. The local plan acknowledges the impact that a two or more story dwelling would have, the need to maintain this area as per the Swanage Townscape Character Assessment. The area is in A and NB and previous applications on the site have been considered under local plan design, design policy uh, as referred to by the neighbour M7. Uh, but design guidance includes townscape character appraisal, the local, the, lo the local plan landscape, historic environment and heritage, which requires sensitive development, taking account of local character and the historic <laughs> environment. Swanage local plan identifies the importance of a single story development on the site. And the emerging local plan policy E12 refers to the importance of townscape character appraisal and design guides. The Swanish townscape character appraisal for the Ballard estate covers the small and compact nature of the estate bungalows and identifies the loss of character <coughs> through change. For over 100 years, the site has been maintained in harmony for the surrounding area and residents. The history of those who came before us in protecting the Ballard Estate is a responsibility that has been passed from Swanage Urban District Council to Perfect District Council and now is in your hands as Dorset Council. I ask you to accept that responsibility to maintain the historic character of the estate, supporting the townscape appraisal. The application itself is of a design and bulk and height that is unacceptable in this position and does not adhere to planning policies long held as sacrosanct to a Ballard Estate. Because you cannot see it yourself, and the recommendations mention little of the damage be done to the estate should you grant permission, I can only ask you to respect the local knowledge and passion that is attached to the site. This is a fourth version or application that purports to be an extension, but involves virtually replacing the building. Please Gary, can I ask you to draw to a conclusion, please? You've well over your three minutes. Sorry, uh, I just ask you to uh, support our community and history of planning on the site and refuse the application. Thank you. Apologies for time, Jim. That's all right. I understand the passion. I'm now going to move on to the other local member, Bill Trite. Morning, uh, thank Bill. You, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I don't think I've come across a planning committee recommendation before which uh, cuts so strikingly across established planning policies that are currently in force and which are the successors to many years of protection of a very well-defined small community. Now, key to this estate's success has been continuous support for the agreed policy of one-story development only, a wise policy which has been in place formally or informally for literally decades. The proposal before the committee today is not just out of all scale with nearby dwellings, but it includes what's described as a loft but which is actually far higher and more spacious than any loft is expected to be, leading entirely reasonably to the conclusion that this is intended to be turned into living accommodation before very long. Indeed, in the applicant's other very recent applications for this address, it was shown rather more honestly as a first floor. If permission is now granted, it will be the trigger for today's harmony to become a ruinous scramble for upward development in the future. Now, the council site visit protocol includes the purpose of assessing proposals in context when and where that is unclear from public viewpoints or from the submitted drawings. One certainly cannot appreciate the dominant nature of these proposals from any public viewpoint, but nor can one do so from the drawings because the drawings have not provided the appropriate information. The council would not appear to have made the necessary request to remedy that, nor does the planning application provide the usual cross section or elevation showing how the planned very high roof of number five would most adversely impact the immediate area, especially number seven next door. The planning authority, the council, is entitled to require from applicants such basic information as these measurements in order to assess their impacts, but apparently has not done so. So in these circumstances, a site visit is strongly indicated 
and it's not the fault of the objectors that this is not currently possible. Why should local residents lose out from the granting of an application which gets through because a justified site visit hasn't been made as a necessary alternative to information not supplied by or demanded from the applicants? This is a serious injustice. I appeal to the committee to pay careful attention to the concerns of so many Ballard Estate residents and their management company, as well as to the views of a particularly well-informed town council, let alone those of individual local councillors on both the Swanage and Dorset authorities. I have personally never known such unified feelings in respect of a planning application before. Finally, please note that there is an outlying section of the Ballard Estate called Ballard Lee. Two houses there do indeed have a second story. However, they were approved before the formal local plan policy of one story only came into force and are anyway on a lower land, so their ridges are below the Ballard Estate bungalow ridges anyway. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. I'm now going to go back to Liz Adams. Is there anything you wish to mention in light of the public representations that you've heard? Uh, thank you, Chair. I hope that most of the points had already been covered in my presentation. Um, just to say again, I guess I, can, I completely understand concerns about loss of um, the typical form that uh, you see or you saw in the photos um, of the, the development on the eastern part of the Ballard Estate, but I would, um, I'm unable to um, concur with con um, the views that this um, bungalow that's proposed for change is a typical form because I would say in the west part of the estate um, it lacks typical form as we saw from the photographs. Um, as, as a planning authority we have to consider the application before us and um, we have to consider whether there will be demonstrable harm to the character of the area and obviously on that point there are differing views um, but your officers um, views have been set out in the planning report. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Liz. OK, I'm now going to move to the committee debate. I already have a list of speakers and the first one is Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is one of those cases where we have a slight problem as a planning committee because we are not these days as local as we used to be in the days of the district councils. Um, so therefore it is hard for us to sort of casually go past places that have come up for uh, a planning application. Uh, I do know this estate because um, I am a perfect person and I have walked through there and I think I've, be, I've done, a, done some work on one of the houses at the other side in the garden, not in the house. Um, and I do regret that there are not, I know it's difficult because our planning officers are not 16 foot tall, but it would be much better or easier to understand the situation if there was a, a long distance photograph, whether it was from an, another uh, viewpoint, a higher point, or these days perhaps drone pictures, because it is a question of getting a sort of overall picture of the area. Obviously, you know, standing in the street, you can only take a picture of two or three houses. And I think it's when you see the entirety of the area that you get what people are so upset about. This particular property is because of the angle of it, sort of more intrusive on what you might call the street scene than it might have been um, further along the estate where they're much more um, at right angles. But I do regret that we are not taking, that we may not uh, be taking on board the difference in atmospheres of areas, um, which is what the Swanage Local Plan was all about. Um, if this had been anywhere else, you know, in an average street, you could say that those uh, alterations were sort of perfectly reasonable. 
but you are talking about a, a particular area, a particular a residential atmosphere. Um, and I do think we are losing a lot by either not having a, a site visit or not having long photographs to show the atmosphere, the type. Um, and I am worried that although, you know, we know that we can only discuss the application as it comes, we also have a responsibility to the future as a planning committee not to set precedents, which will then just mean everything else happens afterwards. It's nothing to do with us is our attitude. We know that if you have what this is an area of smallish, some of them slightly nondescript bungalows, but as soon as one of them gets an application through for effectively a second story, because um, are we really going to go around visiting this place every six months to check they haven't changed the windows? Um, once you had one through, we were, could get a rush of other bungalows with their roofs suddenly um, wanting to be raised to increase loft space. Um, this happens again and again in different areas. And this particular area, it, it would be quite a change. And I am not sure whether we should be allowing um, that sort of change without the, the, the neighbourhood going with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. My next speaker is John Worth. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I have a, have a question for the planning officer. As, as the applicant has stated that they have uh, currently no intention to use this area as a living area and it is a lost space. I question the need for three roof lights in there. Um, if it's just a loft space, why do you need roof lights in there? You know, most lofts just have some form of electric lighting and don't need any any roof lights at all. Um, so if this is the case and the applicant has no need to use it as living accommodation and isn't going to use it as living, living accommodation, I think there's no need for any roof lights. Um, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure um, the officers will want to come back at some point um, and answer your question. My next speaker is David Took. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would echo Councillor Worth's comments on roof lights. That was one of the comments I was going to make myself. There are a couple of other concerns related to the roof lights. Um, I, I'm sure that the officer mentioned earlier that if this um, goes ahead, then the accommodation upstairs uh, in the attic space it could be converted to living accommodation without planning permission, which would presumably then uh, impact on the, the, the whole ethos of the, the Ballard uh, development, uh, which is supposed to be single storey. Um, but my other comment is to do with bulk and height. Now, the height is not being increased over the existing ridge line, but the bulk seems to be massively increased. If we're looking, we're looking currently at slide 27 and uh, photograph B there uh, showing the northeast elevation from a distance. The flat roof as it exists um, is almost impact free. If you then take that height up to another couple of meters, um, it will be a large imposition. It will affect the way that the development looks, the way that that property looks and the the impact and the scale of it uh, will be much increased. Has there been any calculations in terms of the volume of the roof as now and the volume of the roof space as proposed? and what the difference of, of volume might actually be. So I think that that's going to be a significant impact on the, the character of the estate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have two more speakers, so I'm, I'm minded to ask both of them to speak and then I'll come back to officers for a response to this batch. The next speaker is Julie Robinson. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, my questions basically have been answered by councillors Worth and Took. However, are there any internal plans that have been submitted with this application? Because what I'm trying to get at is on the internal plans, are there any stairs leading up to the um, so-called loft in inverted commas? Thank you. Okay. The plans are in front of us now on the um, display, and I think you can see that there are no stairs shown at present. Next speaker is Brian Heatley. Thank you, Chair. Um, the officers have said that this is one story. Uh, they have pointed out that the ridge height is the same, and I think that therefore they, the, their implication is that therefore it is obeying the bits of the plan that say only one story and that it doesn't particularly affect the character. Uh, I'm afraid I rather more go rather more with Councillor Took on this. It seems to me that the extension of the ridge length makes a massive difference to the impact of that roof. If you look at most of the roofs in the pictures, and I admit I don't know this site, so I'm relying on the pictures I've seen, uh, most of them come up to quite a small point, and, and that means that their impact is pretty small, whereas the length of this ridge seems to me changes the character quite substantially. So I do think there is a material change in character involved here. Can I make one other point, which is a completely different one? Uh, the applicants have said that this will enable them to um, uh, to improve the insulation for the property, which of course is um, an excellent thing. And I'm, I'm also very pleased to see the rainwater harvesting. However, uh, I'm sure that improvement could be achieved without this very substantial redevelopment and the embodied energy in replacing an enormous new roof, building a whole lot of new walls for what amounts to a very small gain in accommodation on the ground, ground floor does seem to me to be um, something which uh, is not helping us mitigate climate change. So I, I, there is a kind of wasteful element in the extension that worries me. Uh, so I, unless I hear something very different in the rest of this, I think I will be opposing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. I'm going to now go back to Liz Adams for some response to the first batch of speakers, and then I have uh, Shane Bartlett after that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in, uh, a question was asked about um, why why three roof lights were being proposed. Um, it's not it's not officers um, position to question the intentions behind planning applications it's to look at what is proposed and consider whether it meets or accords with the planning policies um, I can I understand concerns that um, about the interpretation of what single story means um, there's obviously there's two issues here one is about um, the heights of eaves and ridges that would be anticipated with a two-story development and there's also um, the issue that's been raised about how um, attics are used. Um, I think that that is a separate issue because um, if you consider what could be achieved under permitted development um, and also the internal alterations that could be undertaken, which wouldn't represent development under Section 55 of the Town and Country Planning Act, then um, the actual use of that of an attic space doesn't have an impact, whereas um, the creation of a two story dwelling um, could have significant impact on, on the character and appearance of the area. So try, it's trying to distinguish um, in planning terms what it means by single story development. So a uh, question is why why the three roof lights? Get rid of the three roof lights, we wouldn't have concern. There would be a, a lesser concern about it looking like two story development. Um, but the roof lights are intended to serve the attic, presumably, and um, and officers have had to consider whether the um, insertion of those three roof lights would be out of character with the area. Other other properties have got roof lights. Um, number um, eight, um, this house has got a roof light. Um, 
roof lights can often be added under permitted development. Um, so Liz is, and Chairman, sorry, I, I, you go first, Chairman. I, I was going to say you cut out briefly there, Liz. Do you just want oh, to go sorry. with that last point again? Uh, I was, I think I was just saying that um, uh, there were other properties in the area with roof lights it's not a, a completely new feature and that um, such works can often be undertaken as permitted development. Kim. Yes um, if I may Madam Chairman Kim Cowell here. Um, the members have um, asked questions about the need for roof lights. I'd just like to remind members again about the um, advice in the MPPF about the use of conditions in Liz is report presentation. Um, she's made it very clear to members about the conditions that um, officers have recommended as part of the um, officer recommendation to ensure there aren't any impacts. Um, the conditions require the uh, roof lights to be fixed and obscure glazed and MPPF paragraph 54 um, advises that local planning authorities should consider whether otherwise unacceptable development could be made acceptable through the use of conditions or planning obligations. Um, planning conditions should be kept to a minimum and only imposed where they are necessary, relevant to planning and to the development to be permitted, enforceable, precise, and then it goes on to um, to clarify it in, in, in um, paragraph 55. In this instance, um, three roof lights are proposed and your officers have um, conditioned them to be obscure glazed and fixed and removed permitted development for the insertion of windows on other roof slopes. Thank you. Thank you very much for that clarification, Kim. Liz, was there anything else you wanted to add um, uh, in response to the member comments? Thank you. There was a question about volume um, of the roof. Um, there's no um, policy in this area that requires um, development to be proportionate or, or um, anything that would require volume particularly to um, be necessary to be calculated. The, the issue is would the proposed extension um, have a demonstrable harm to the character of the area rather than is it a particular percentage bigger which is why that's not been um, mentioned and um, as has already been confirmed there yeah there's no stairs proposed although as I've already said um, it wouldn't be development if they um, were added in the future but um, under building regulations there would be requirements um, related to um, the um, light, means of escape from the first floor which couldn't be achieved with roof lights that are fixed shut. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Our next speaker is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've just got a quick quick question for the officers and it's do we have an assurance that the surface water drainage has been properly addressed um, in regards to the harvester tank and this won't present a problem in the future for neighbouring properties? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, that is the intention of um, condition four because we're aware that obviously if, if they go away on holiday or, or something and, and that water isn't being used then um, it needs to be um, and it just needs to be controlled so um, condition four requires that details be provided prior to um, commencement of development. Thank you. May I come back Madam Chairman? Back? Yes of course. Thank you. Yeah that, that's that's my concern about um, the, the the issue is going to be for further updated with officers. Um, it's a little bit of a frustration that quite often we don't have those details in front of us. Um, well, I can, can I continue, Madam Chairman? Please do. Yep. Um, excellent report from the officer. Um, first class report. Really enjoyed it. Um, I'd just like to make a few comments about, about the application that's in front of us. Um, in terms of the bulk of the property, uh, I noticed from the photographs that we've seen, I appreciate we, we weren't able to do a, a site visit, but the estate to me from what appeared in the photos was that we've got an estate here that has been developed over a hundred years or so. And the properties in it are very varied in both in size and in and appearance. Um, it's quite a mix of properties there. Um, and I noticed that it talks about a, a special character area. And I think that just accommodates the bungalow 
um, aspect of this. It's supposedly an estate that only has um, accommodation on, on, the, on the ground floor. However, the estate sits on undulating ground. The ridge heights are all various different heights. Um, the ridge heights within the buildings are at different heights. The ridge heights appearing actually within the topography of the area are all at different heights. So it's quite a mix there. I don't really consider that this, while it is a lot bulkier than the original design, I don't consider it is um, to the extent that it causes demonstrable harm to the area. Um, and this is obviously a subjective view, isn't it, you know, to an individual. But to my mind, it, it doesn't appear as such to me. And I think that the, um, I think the, the design of it, while I appreciate the fact about the roof lights within the conditions, I think that has been addressed. And I think on the basis of that, Madam Chairman, I'm I'm minded to go with the officer recommendation on this, but I'll listen to the further debate. Thank you. Well, I have no further speakers at the moment and I don't have a proposal from anybody. Would you like to make a proposal? Madam Chairman, on, on everything I've just said and what is contained within the officer's report and the conditions that are laid out and subject to the references have made be made in the MPPF document and I appreciate the emotions of the area but I really feel that it does follow um, planning guidance and there is no material planning considerations that would warrant refuse on that basis Madam Chairman. I'm happy to propose that we go with the uh, officer's recommendation to grant and the conditions that are laid out within the report. Thank you. Thank you. Members do I have a seconder? So I have no seconder and I have no one else requesting to speak. Therefore, as chairman, I'm going to second the proposal uh, just so that we can move the debate on. Does anybody wish to speak to the proposal on the table? I have no further speakers. In that case, I am going to put the matter to the vote. John Worth, you've just got in very quickly. Speak now. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't type fast enough, Madam Chairman. Um, <laughs> all I would like to say on this is that I would support the proposal um, if we could condition that there were no roof lights, if that's possible, because I, I just feel that that would allay some of the fears of the local people that it's going to be used as accommodation in the future. Uh, but that's my only comment. I don't know whether that can be added or it's supported or whatever, but but that's my feeling. Liz, do you want to uh, respond to that request, please? Only to say that that isn't the application that's before us. Did you hear me? I did. I'm Sorry. just trying to, so, I'm just trying so to in other words, <laughs> So the application is for three roof lights in the roof. Um, and um, to remove those three roof lights would require new plans. So um, you would not be able to uh, approve what is before you. Thank you for that clarification. Alex, you wanted to come back. If I could, Chair, um, I always get slightly confused about the, the procedure, but could I propose a rejection as an alternative? Not at the moment. Not we at have, the moment. Okay. We have a proposal for grant which has been proposed and seconded. Okay. I can only take an amendment to that. I cannot take an amendment that is in direct opposition to that. Fair enough. So we will go to the vote. It happens. And if the vote fails, then I will go back to the committee for an alternative recommendation. OK, so I have no more speakers. It has been proposed to grant and has been seconded. I will now take the roll call of members. So Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have listened to the officer's presentation. I've taken part in the debate and I vote for. Thank you, Alex Brenton. I have been here and listened and taken part in the debate and I vote against. Thank you. 
Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the full presentation and uh, I support the recommendation before us. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Um, I've been present throughout, heard the debate and the presentations vote against. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. Thank you, Chairman. I've been present throughout the um, presentation and the debate and um, I'm voting against. Okay. Brian Heatley. I've been present throughout and I'm voting against. Thank you. David Morgan. I've been present throughout, Madam Chairman, and I vote against. Thank you. Judy Robinson. I've been present throughout and taken part in the debate and I vote against. Thank you. David Took. I've been present th I've been present throughout and listened very carefully and taken part in the debate and I vote against. Thank you. Bill Trite has acted as local member on this occasion and has not taken part in the debate and will not be taking part in the voting. John Worth. Uh, I have been present throughout, taken part in the debate and I vote against. Thank you. On this occasion, a seconder of the proposal, I will vote in favour. So, David Northover, can you give me the outcome of the vote? Uh, three, four and eight against. OK, in that case, the proposal for grant falls. I will now go back to the members for an alternative proposal. David Took. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think the inevitable consequence of the previous vote is that somebody needs to propose a vote to reject the application, so I would propose that we do so. Chairman, Dave North over here. Um, obviously, it is a, uh, a proposal to um, re reject. There needs to be a reason for that, is my understanding. I have just asked Councillor Took for his planning reasons for his proposal. OK. Uh, planning reasons are bulk and impact on the, the local uh, character. character, that's the word, the local character. Thank you, Brian. Uh, um, I, 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 I feel that the it's, it's not so much the living accommodation or the, or the lights, although they are quite worrying, um, but it is the, the, the very large increase in, in the bulk of the roof space and the impact of that on the character of the area on what is a, a quite a, a, an open plan area so will that will that suffice as reasons or do i have to think faster on my feet you need to call some policies kim cowell here please councillor took uh, I'm not sufficiently familiar with policies. Perhaps the officers could help with that. Um, they're in the officer report. You've got the Turnscape, you've got the Swanage Local Plan. They're all detailed in the report, councillors. OK, thank you. Um, Swanage Turnscape Character Development. Um, I need to go through and find them. I, 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 That's I'm right. Not... I'm just I'm looking them up as well. Hold on. On <laughs> um, here. Yeah. I've got the. Um, if you look on page seventy three, it lists yeah. the um, policy references that may assist you, councillor in um, deciding which policies that you would like to um, include in the reason. Well, I, I think the 
policy LHH, landscape, historic environment and heritage, and the uh, Southeast Purbeck policies, the emerging Purbeck local plan, and the Swanish townscape character appraisal, and the Purbeck district design guide are all relevant in setting out that um, unacceptable um, bulk of development is, 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 is grounds for rejection. Kim, are you satisfied with those Thank policy you. references? I, I think we can make reference to the relevant policies the councillor has um, referred to. The, um, the only concern I'd have is, is, as the officer report clearly sets out, is reference to an emerging local plan that we can only give very limited weight to. So I'd be I'd I'd be very cautious about relying on the policies in that local plan as, as members have done before where we've had costs against us. So um, we would need to review whether or not we make reference to that. I would I would strongly suggest you refer to the um, adopted local plans rather than the emerging local plan. OK, um, although I must say that as time goes on, that uh, emerging plan is becoming more and more weighty and the latest um, information is is that the inspector is is fairly in favour of it as it stands but I'll leave that to your discretion if I may. Kim do you want to respond to that? Uh, no I, that I concur with what the councillor said but I don't think we're in that position yet. Okay. Okay. Would, right. would you mind if I read out what I've got down um, chair this is Adams? Yes. Um, so I've got the proposal would, by reason of the bulk of the roof, have a negative impact on the local character of the Ballard Down, contrary to policy STCD of Swanage Local Plan and policies LHH and D of the Purbeck Local Plan. Okay. Are you happy with that as proposer? Thank you, yes. Yep. Do I have a seconder? Yes, yes. I'm prepared to yeah. second. Okay, I've got Alex Brenton down to speak, and I don't know who that was that spoke up. Sorry, it was me, Brian Heatley. Okay. Um, Alex, did you want to second? Yes, uh, Chair. I was very happy okay. to second that. I was. Uh, I'm, hang on, I'm hang, on. In gloves. hang on. It's hang on a slow. minute. <laughs> hang on. I will take you a second because you were down to speak next. Um, and I'll come back to Brian if he, if you wish to speak in favour of the proposal. OK, so Alex, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I do wish to second uh, the rejection of this. Um, certainly, I know the the Purbeck Emerging Plan is getting more um, weight as it goes on. It sounds though the examiner is minded to pass it with the modifications now, which include some um, references to local plans and character of, de of areas. So I am very happy to second this. Thank you. OK, Brian, just to confirm um, in the chat, you said you no longer wish to speak. Can you just confirm that for transparency, please? Yes, I was I was just trying to second it. Thank you. OK, thank you. Do I have any other member that wishes to speak to the proposal to refuse this application? OK, in that case, I will move to the vote. We have a proposal to refuse, uh, which has been duly seconded. The planning officer has re read out the form of words. If members are happy with that, um, speak if you're not. Otherwise, I will move directly to the vote. OK, so back to the roll call. Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the discussion around a proposal that's been put on the table and I vote against. OK. Alex Brenton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I have listened to and participated in that last piece of debate and I'm very happy to um, vote for our decision to reject. OK, thank and, you. Uh, which way round we go? You are you are 
voting to refuse. That that is the uh, yeah. proposed on the table. So you either support uh, refusal or not. I support refusal. Thank you. My next uh, person is Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I've listened to the, all the debate on the uh, latest proposal uh, and I vote against. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Uh, I've listened to the further debate and uh, I vote for the proposal, which is against. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. I've listened to the uh, the uh, subsequent debate and of what's been proposed and uh, I support the refusal. Thank you. Brian Heatley. I've listened to debate and I'm voting for the proposal, please. Okay. David Morgan. I've listened to the debate, Madam Chairman, and I vote for uh, refusal. Okay, Judy Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the debate and I support the refusal. Thank you, David Took. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the debate, to the debate. I've been present throughout and I vote in favour of the proposal to refuse Thank the you. application. Thank you very much. Uh, Bill Trite, as I said before, has acted as local member and not taken part in the debate and will not be voting. John Worth. Yes, Madam Chairman, I've uh, listened to the debate and taken part in it and I vote for refusal. Thank you. OK, so I would normally go to David Northover, but however, his connection has temporarily dropped out. So Phil Crowther, I'm putting you on the spot. Have you been able to make a record of the vote? Chairman. Uh, yes, I have. I make it um, eight against and two, f sorry, eight, four and two against. Yeah, that concurs with what I've uh, been jotting down as well. So the voting is confirmed as eight in favour of the proposal to refuse this application and two against. Therefore, the application has been refused. Thank you very much, members, for the debate on this one. Not an easy one. OK, I'm now going to move on to the second application before us today. And that is agenda item seven. To erect a temporary agricultural workers dwelling at New Park Farm, Lichit Matravers, which is pages 51 to 67 on your agenda. And uh, Liz, you're going to be presenting this one to us as well? Yes. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one minute while I get the slides up. So uh, this application is for a temporary workers caravan for residential use at New Park Farm on Dolman's Hill in Lichit. Uh, the application comes before members due to the balanced nature of the decision, which is based on an acceptance that there are very special circumstances that outweigh the harm to the Greenbelt. The Parish Council has objected to the proposal because they do not consider that a case for a dwelling has been made and they wish to see the Greenbelt protected. The site lies west of Lichit Matravers in open countryside designated as Greenbelt. Um, I've just zoomed in here, you can see the Upton Bypass, Blanford Road, Litchett Matravers off Wareham Road up here, and the site lies between Litchett and Morton in this area. The site is approximately one and a half kilometres by rural road to get to um, Litchett and about two kilometres to the shops. The site comprises part of an agricultural holding, you see here in the blue, which is um, 13 hectares in size. Eight and a half uh, of those are pasture and four and a half are woodland. And this has been separated from Old Park Farm and is understood to be in the applicant's ownership and a further 3.2 hectares of land at Old Park Farm is also to be rented. The applicants who are experienced in agriculture have started a micro dairy business and a um, cattle farm. 
The supporting agricultural appraisal explains that it is intended that by year three, the business is to include a micro dairy with 10 cows producing 5,000 litres of milk per annum for sale to the public with unsold milk used to feed um, bucket reared calves. That's one element. Second element is a beef cattle breeding, rearing and showing enterprise. Um, at the time of applying, uh, the applicants owned four suckler cows with nine calves and 13 heifers, but further calves will by now have been born. And the third element is bucket reared calves uh, to be reared in batches of 40 uh, to be accommodated in the barn that was recently granted planning permission under delegated powers. So aerial view for you of the site and as uh, a farm track leading down to a former silage pit. So this is the barn that was recently approved, which is about 100 metres away from the area where the caravans to be sited um, in the valley. And the proposal is for a change of use of this area, so the red line's a little bit faint, um, but it's for this area to um, enable a caravan to be sited. This is to provide accommodation for the rural worker and her family. Um, the accommodation will enable the applicants to live close to and properly monitor their livestock. Um, the land holding is undulating. The barn is to be sited in the valley, as I said, and it's proposed that the caravan will be sited on in this area, um, which is more elevated, but has been chosen because it already offers a hard surface and screening provided by banking and vegetation. These photographs show that context. So, um, sorry, I haven't managed to label the, the plants, but uh, you, photos rather. This is the tr um, farm track that comes uh, around to the um, enclosed area, the former silage pitch, pit. This is um, the eastern area here where you can see the bank and the screening and the, again, screening around in sort of a U shape around the area where the caravan is proposed to be sited. Although, um, so although elevated, the um, area provides an appropriate location for temporary dwelling to limit the visual impact within the green belt and the rural context. Um, here we have a further photo of the um, sort of the side of the, the pit where you can see the wooden uh, um, uh, sort of wooden retaining wall and, and vegetation. And then this is a site looking down the hill, um, but a tree cover screens any long distance views. The proposed caravan has a log cabin appearance, uh, wooden cladding, uh, again, to mitigate its visual impact. So the sighting of the caravan in the Greenbelt is inappropriate development. Um, although um, I've already explained the impact on openness would be minimised by its proposed location, nevertheless, substantial weight is to be given to the harm to the Greenbelt by reason of inappropriateness. Um, additionally, the proposal is for a dwelling in open countryside and it's therefore necessary to consider whether there are any very special circumstances that would outweigh the harm from the proposed temporary siting of the caravan. So in this case, your officers are satisfied that very special circumstances do exist. This is on the basis of the essential need for a rural worker to live on the site to facilitate the growth of the new rural business. In order to come to this conclusion, officers have engaged and taken advice of an independent agricultural consultant referred to in the report as the council's consultant, who has carefully considered the appraisal that supports the application on behalf of the council. The appraisal has demonstrated that the needs of the business do justify a worker for hours that are only slightly less than full time. The critical factor is whether it is essential for this worker to live on the site. Uh, the applicant's appraisal explains that this is required to ensure the well-being of cattle and mitigate losses from illness, injury and death. The council's agricultural consultant has reported that the essential need is borderline, but on balance may be justified if the business develops as proposed with prospects of further expansion. The borderline assessment is due to the limited number of cattle currently on the site, but as the business is in its infancy, each animal is currently of greater relative importance. So granting a temporary dwelling would provide the applicants with the chance to develop their business in accordance with Chapter 6 of the National Planning Policy Framework. And this supports the sustainable growth and expansion of a rural business. The agricultural consultant is satisfied that supporting financial information suggests that the business has a prospect of being economically viable and there are no alternative properties available in the vicinity of the site. 
So in summary, the recommendation is approval for the siting of the caravan for a temporary period of three years on the basis that the applicant's rural business proposals necessitate an on-site presence. And this is an appropriate period for them to demonstrate that their business plan is sound. At the end of this period, they would have the opportunity to apply for planning permission for a permanent dwelling if they can demonstrate that there is a business need. Otherwise, the caravan can be removed and the openness of the green belt restored. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that. We have one public speaker. Chelsea, over to you, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so we have the comment from the agent, Alan Davies, on behalf of Chapman Lilly. Chairman, members, thank you for the opportunity to address you. You see, in, uh, you see applications for temporary agricultural workers dwellings in the countryside. In recent years, these have tended to be for, for more unusual and exotic uses. This is absolutely not the case with this application. Refreshingly, it's a traditional cattle farm submitted by a local couple whose whole working lives have been in agriculture, who appreciate the countryside. As you know, generally, personal circumstances are rarely a material plan consideration. But in this instance, I think it's important that you know more of the background to this application and the people involved, so you can have assurance of their genuine intentions. Tony, with wife Jo and their family, son and daughter, have been in agriculture his work in life and engaged in dairy cow production since the age of 11. He studied farm business management at Victor Agricultural College, passing with merits and distinctions. He was made redundant in May 2000 from his last post, dairy farm manager, when the farm he managed was sold to another farming family. Losing his job and with it their home was absolutely devastating. A lifetime opportunity then presented itself to purchase land in the area where they had lived for the past 22 years and start their own agricultural business. Tony is a member of the Wall and Bear Regis Agricultural Discussion Group. Wife Jo has a lifetime on farms and has actively supported County and Puddletown Young Farmers Club for many years. So as you can see, these are genuine local farming folk. The plan is to develop a cattle breeding and rearing business and establish a micro dairy business. Calf rearing will also be undertaken. Care will be taken with the site for the temporary dwelling. The disused silage pit already has screening and bunding on three sides and existing access. It is ideal for overseeing the animals and yet has minimal impact upon the landscape and environment. You commissioned an independent assessment of the application which the proposals passed. The proposal will accord with your current and emergent local plan policies. We ask that you give these genuine local folk a chance to establish their holding. You have the opportunity to assist the proposals at the end of that three year period. This gives you more than adequate control and checks. So I hope you can see this is a genuine and well considered proposal from a genuine farming family. For the reasons I've outlined, I would commend the officer recommendation to you and respectfully request that you grant temporary permission. We also have a comment from Litchett Matravers Parish Council. Thank you for bringing this to committee rather than delegating the decision to your officers. The report sets out our reasons for objecting, so there is little point in simply reiterating those to you now. Our major concerns relate to the Greenbelt. The agent for this application was, until very recently, the Development Control Manager at Purbeck District Council. He knew and carried out his job very well, taking every opportunity to emphasise the importance and sanctity of the Greenbelt, with any development therein only being acceptable in very particular special circumstances. The Parish Council are aware that special needs of agriculture may be such a justification. That has been argued by the applicant. However, notwithstanding any report by specialists accompanying the application, there is no justification or evidence provided within the application that a minor enterprise such as this can be a truly viable business proposition, still less that an on-site dwelling is necessary to support it. We are constantly being told that small family farms are no longer viable. Family farms are regularly being absorbed into larger, more efficient parcels or being broken into small pony and hobby fragments. Litchett Matravers is surrounded by numerous fragmented remnants of far family farms, many now sprouting caravans, sheds, playhouses, deck chairs and play slides. The essential quality of the Greenbelt, the openness, is being irredeemably eroded. The Parish Council are concerned and keen to see this trend reversed. We'd like you to know if you, the local planning authority, will support us in this. We therefore respectfully ask that you refuse this application. Thank you. That's all the comments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, Chelsea. Liz, in light of the representative, oh, sorry, before I go to that, I do apologise. Local members, um, I have Andrew Starr listening in. Andrew, do you wish to speak? I wasn't intending to, Madam Chairman. Thank you. 
OK, thank you. And Alex Brenton, you are on the committee. Do you wish to speak now or do you wish to speak during the debate? Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I'll speak now. Um, if that's all right. Carry on. This, this is an this is an area I know very well because I walk past it regularly. So it's it's part of the rural section between my village of Morden and my ward village of Lichit Matravers. Um, it's hard to see on this map, but it is actually a very hilly area. And traditionally for many years, um, the boundary between Morden and Lichit has been um, created by this green, steep and very muddy valley. Um, if you go back to the map of um, where it shows the Dolmond Hill Lane, this one here, this uh, the lane that's marked as Dolmond's Hill effectively is the top of the hill. And when you stand there, you look across to green fields almost continually. This is mostly a historic issue caused by a neighbouring estate refusing to sell land. So there is a very, very strong green barrier along here. Um, I agree with the, the application to a certain extent in that this would be this. I, it's hard to call it a mobile home. It is actually a wooden uh, house. Uh, would be barely visible, but you would be having, but it is an encroachment onto what is really very clearly green fields and green belt. People often go about green belt as though it's all perfect. This is a very green agricultural valley. There is obviously justification as it would be agricultural, and agricultural is one of the exceptions for development in the green belt. Um, I personally have issues about whether um, a farm of this size on such incredibly wet clay soil is particularly viable. But the issue would be more the the, pre uh, the precedent set and Lichit Matravers in itself is very strong on the precedent set by piecemeal small parcels of greenbelt effectively becoming residential. Um, yes, they might survive for three years, make a bit of a, a, a business case, and then we go, of course, into um, applications for more permanent business, uh, for more permanent dwelling. This has happened in the area, not in these fields, but around Lichit in the past. After three years, a more permanent residence is built, and after two more years, the cows disappear. And so I, I just want to flag up to the committee that green belt it should be for used perhaps for agricultural purposes. And this particular application, you might look with favour, but it is continually nibbling at the same sort of places. Um, and so I, I am completely uh, on the balance on this one. It would nice to be see, see this valley being used, but I do think we need to have serious consideration about what happens next. And that is a difficult one for us to deal with, uh, but I do want to flag up to other members that this is in itself unexceptional, but it is, could very easily be in five years time a rather nice residential property with um you know a bit of woodland um so i'm not quite sure at the moment where to leave it but i do want co committee members to think of the whole situation not just whether one small building um in an ex silage clamp is unexceptional so we shouldn't worry about it thank you Thank you very much, Alex. That's fired everybody up. I'm going to ask Liz to come back on both yours and the other public speakers, please. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we 
as officers have taken account of the information that we have been provided in the agricultural appraisal, obviously um, there are elements of that which include private information and financial information that is uh, necessarily confidential. So it has not been possible to um, to publicise all that, but it has been looked at by an independent agricultural consultant on behalf of the council who is satisfied um, that there is an on-balance essential need and that the business does have the potential to be uh, financially viable. So um, that is sufficient um, to support a three-year temporary caravan at this stage. Um, what happens next will be up to the, whatever uh, future applications may come in and they will be determined on their merits against the evidence that is available. And um, whilst it's appreciated that, um, uh, you know, suspicions can be raised when you see agricultural worker dwelling conditions removed from properties, I, um, we can't use that um, to uh, pre be prejudicial against um, new agricultural um, propositions coming forward and obviously there, there is um, a benefit to the land being farmed. Thank you. Thank you very much Liz. I'm now going to move on to the member debate and my first speaker is Mike Dyer. Thank you Chairman. Um, I'm um, sympathetic to this application, but I have a worry, which is that from experience in a predecessor council, uh, um, if my memory serves me correctly, we we're almost always warned um, by the case officer in similar applications that temporary permissions were almost impossible um, to um, rescind um, if uh, at the end of the three year period in this case, um, it proved not to the business proved not to be viable or the um, uh, the temporary um, unit was unviable. So could I ask the officer for, for co uh, comment on that? And um, has there have there ever been any examples in your experience of that happening? In other words, the unit being removed at the end of a a period um, when the business proved not to be um, developed as expected or to be viable. Thanks, Jim. Liz, I'm going to pass that one to Kim to answer. Um, I'm not aware of um, of that situation. I'm sorry to say um, the um, most of the schemes that I'm aware of um, We've had um, viability reports submitted after three years um, with evidence that demonstrate that the schemes are viable. I am, however, aware of the scenarios that um, where um, schemes later down the line um, have sought to have conditions lifted. But as Liz said, we have to deal with each application on its merits. Officers here have gone to an agricultural consultant to, to look through the um, viability of this scheme and the advice is set out in the report and we have to treat this application that's before us on its merits, not what might happen at some future point. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Mike, are you happy with that response? Well, I wouldn't describe it as happy because I don't think it was really an answer, but um, <laughs> um, I understand uh, I understand what was said. Um, and if you'd like to move on, that's fine, Chairman. Thank you. My next speaker is Robin Cook. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I don't want to go over what's already been said, but I, uh, what Mike Dyer said, I, I sympathise with and I agree because I was in that past life as well and I faced that situation. Um, Kim more or less uh, Robin, made the point. Robin. That, yes. Robin. Yes. Your um, feed is drifting in and out. Do you want to start again? Oh. Please, we're not, uh, right. you, you okay. keep freezing. Is that, oh, is that better? Is that any better? No. I, I, I can what? Really is that any better now? Yeah, I, I dropped out as well then. I was just starting to panic. Yeah, uh, I've had some issues. Um, I've had, I have had some issues this morning with my IT. Equally. Can you hear me? And I'll move on to the next speaker and that's Shane, 
Robin, you still keep dropping out. What I'll do yeah. is I'll go to Shane, then I'll come back to you and hopefully it'll sort itself out in the meantime. Shane, over to you, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I just have a question for the officers surrounding um, condition four, because uh, I'm also sympathetic with the applications in front of us, and I'm mindful of the concerns that um, Councillor Dyer and Councillor Cook have had um, surrounding given temporary accommodation within Greenbelt. And I'm just wondering whether in condition four, we were able to strengthen that up by saying that the um, rather than just being somebody employed in agriculture, it would actually be someone who's employed in managing livestock because I thought that was the whole reason for actually bringing this temporary accommodation onto the site. And I think it would actually strengthen the position of should any enforcement be needed in the future rather than an, uh, somebody who's actually um, living within that caravan than just looking after the ducks that's on the lake there that's in the wood. Um, if we actually strengthen it and say that they have to be managing livestock, is, was, is that a reasonable request? Liz, do you want to come back on that, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we could we could potentially strengthen it. That That is the sort of standard condition that is considered to be a, um, standard for agricultural workers dwelling. So um, yet yeah, we could add in um, so limited solely or mainly occupied in. Um, so counts, um, would you mind reminding me through the chair? Yeah, the, the, the um, condition four that yes. they are employed, that they are employed in um, managing livestock. So if we said manage, yeah, managing livestock, um, mainly employed in managing livestock. Um, yeah. Um, and we could say on the site. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I'll speak later, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I, I'll let you go, go back to Councillor Cook. OK. OK, thank you. Robin, we'll try you again now, please. Is that any better, Chairman? Can you hear? Seems to be, yeah. Go yeah, for it. Is that better? Um, as I say, I've been having one or two IT issues this morning, so my apologies for this. Um, I, what I was going to say was that Kim more or less answered uh, what, to some extent what I was going to say, that we obviously have to look at what's in front of us now. We can all um, theorise about what might happen three or four years down the line. Um, one of the things here, it's exceptional circumstances we, we're looking at, and there is, I don't think it's our place to judge whether the business will be viable or not. It's whether what's in front of us is acceptable, and to some people it's not going to be, to others it is. I've always supported to try to support rural business and particularly small rural businesses which are in a very very important part of the economy of Dorset and we're in a period now this last 12 to 18 months particularly where small businesses are beginning to flourish even more and more so I would hope that it would be successful and I do think to some extent it's an incumbent upon us as an authority to support somebody who's going forward in this manner so I'm, in, uh, I'm very much actually in favour of this. I understand the feelings about m possible impact in the future, but looking at it as it is now, we have got a condition in about removal in three years time, given that things don't work. Um, I don't know whether um, if, it, if it is successful, uh, whether permanence would be applied there or whether they would have to seek an alternative site. I don't know whether anybody wants to answer that, whether that would have to go and an alternative site be found if it's going to be a more permanent operation. But on balance, I think it's, you know, I think we need to support it for the business sake. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Do you want to respond to that comment, please? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this is being considered to be an appropriate site for the sighting of a caravan for a temporary period. Whether it's appropriate for a house would really depend on um, a number of factors, including whether the agricultural or whether the very special circumstances were again met in, in three years time, what the design of that building was, what additional development would be required to service it. So there's a lot of unknowns at this stage. Thank you. OK, thank you. 
Uh, Robin, are you content with that answer? Uh, well, yes, that, that's the answer, obviously, that I would expect. And yes, we have to look at that as and when it arises and make the decision at that time. So thank you, Liz. And uh, I still feel that I, on balance, I would support this. Uh, in fact, I would go to the point now of, of uh, proposing uh, we uh, accept the recommendation on the table to grant. OK, thank you. Shane, you wanted to come back. Do you wish to second? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I do wish to second. Shall I speak now? Yes, please. I think, um, again, another very good presentation to the officer, so thank you. And I think what's been in front of us, the proposed siting of the caravan would bring a limited impact within the green belt and the site is well screened. The independent agricultural consultant is satisfied that for the welfare of the animals, the livestock manager needs to be on the site. And consideration, I think, should be given to the prospect of supporting a local business and venture and that giving employment with it, employment prospects within the area. I notice that in condition there has to be a removal of the caravan in three years, which I'm satisfied with. And as I've already mentioned about condition four, which I think is reasonable, but I think it strengthens it if, if we write into condition four that actually the sole purpose for the um, accommodation being on that site is that it has to have a livestock manager that has been already mentioned by the independent agricultural cons consultant. So I think on the basis of that, Madam Chair, yes, I'm happy to um, second the proposal that's on the table and that we grant permission. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just get confirmation um, from Robin as proposer that you are happy with the change to condition four and you have included that in your proposal to grant? Yes, I'm happy with that, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. For the benefit of the minutes, I need to confirm that Bill Trite joined the meeting at 11.20. Um, obviously, he had stepped out for the previous application, um, but has been involved in the whole of the presentation and the debate so far. So do any other members wish to speak before I put the matter to the vote? Mm. Uh, yes, may I just say a I've word? Got a, sorry, I've got Can an RTS you, in. Uh, I do not have an RTS. I only had Alex, Mike Dyer, Robin Cook and Shane Bartlett. <clears throat> I did have a very short drop out of connectivity myself. So if you wish to speak, can you please put it in the chat bar so I can see in the correct order, please? Because if you all shout at once, I, I can't see who's asking. So if you wish to speak, please type now. Madam Chairman, you do have Councillor Trite and Councillor Took in the chat bar. I think, you, as you say, you dropped out, I think was the problem. I confirm that. I, I can't see it. I've no, got I, Shane I at 11.34. So, David, if you can see the chat bar, can you tell me who's next to speak, please? Yes, I can confirm. Uh, firstly, Councillor Took and then Councillor Trite. Sorry, Councillor Trite. Yes. OK, that's lovely. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. Wonders of modern technology. So David Took, you're next to speak. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, yes, I, I I am inclined to support this. I appreciate and approve of uh, Councillor Bartlett's uh, strengthening of the conditions so that it's um, used only by uh, people involved in livestock management, which fits with para 1515 on page 60, which describes the, the essential need is, is really down to the fact that it is livestock uh, for which you can have emergencies. If all they were doing was uh, growing silage, for example, you wouldn't have a midnight emergency. Whereas if you're having cattle on the site, you may well. Um, I think condition four being strengthened in that way is excellent. It takes about two to three years for a business generally to prove profitable or not. And I think the three year time scale for this in order to prove viability um, is, is, is pretty much about right. If they can't do that within three years, then, then they're probably going to go bankrupt anyway. Um, and three years is a fairly small length of time in the uh, in history of Wessex. Um, and I think I think this will work admirably well. Thank you. 
Thank you. So my next speaker is Bill Trout. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I, I have tried to um, RTS you, but evidently it's not got through. Um, it, this is all a matter, is it not, of where one puts the weight? Um, and, I, you know, I understand exactly what um, uh, Councillor Robin Cook was saying. Um, I, I empathise with that, um, but I think I agree more with what um, Mike Dyer was saying. Um, unfortunately, my my own experience suggests that in practice, um, temporary permissions of this kind by one means or another tend to become permanent. Um, and I also have the growing belief that we should be strong in the defence of the green belt. So again, it's on balance where you put the weight. On balance, I do not think that this is a good idea and therefore on balance, I do not favour the application. Thank you. Thank you very much. I still am not seeing anything in the chat bar. David, can you confirm if I have any more speakers, please? There, there are no further speakers. I, I see Councillor Bartlett had right to speak, but I think that may be just to have alerted you to the other two speakers. OK, just for clarity, Shane, can you confirm that, please? Yeah, that is correct, Madam Chairman. Thank you. It's really difficult flying blind. Um, OK, so it has been proposed and seconded to grant uh, with a change to condition four, just tightening that up to um, say that the condition is for managing livestock, not just a general agricultural condition. So I'm now going to put it to the vote and we'll go through the roll call. Uh, so Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I have listened to the officer's report and I've taken part in the debate and I vote for. Thank you. Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. I have listened to the debate. I have, um, I gave a, a, a beginning. Sorry, um, sorry, could I, sorry, it's still crowded. Could I just interrupt? My recollection was that Councillor Brenton took part as the local member, rather oh. than as a member of the committee. And, and on that basis, should I, should shouldn't I be taking part as a, a voting member on this item. If I've got that wrong, then then I apologise, but that was my understanding. I, I did offer um, Alex the opportunity to speak as a ward member or as member of the committee, and she opted to speak as ward member. OK. Does that Sorry. mean I can't? OK. Sorry, Alex. Fair enough. OK, Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I've uh, followed the full presentation and I've taken part in the debate and listened to all the comments and I vote to support. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Uh, I've listened to the debate and the presentations and I vote against, Chairman. Thank you. Barry Gorringe. I've listened to the debate and the presentation and I support the amendment, um, so I'm for. Thank you. Brian Heatley. I've listened to the debate and I'm voting for. Thank you. David Morgan. Can members please turn the microphones off, please? Thank you. Sorry, David Morgan. I've listened to the debate, Madam Chairman, and I vote for. Thank you. Julie Robinson. I've listened to the debate and I vote for. Thank you. David Took. I've listened to the debate throughout and I vote for. Thank you. Bill Trite. Um, I've listened to the presentation and the uh, debate and on balance I'm voting against. Thank you. And John Worth. Uh, I've listened to the presentation and I vote for, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. OK, that is everybody. So David Northover, can you please confirm the outcome of the vote? And and uh, obviously, the, the local member, uh, Councillor Brunton, uh, was uh, not able to vote on this. OK, you, your connection wobbled a little bit. Can you please repeat the voting? Eight for, two against, 
that's that's the vote. OK, thank you. Therefore, the application is granted with the change to condition four. Thank you very much, members. Interesting debate. So that then takes us to item nine on our agenda. Sorry, item eight on our agenda, planning appeals. Morning, okay, members. You're going to yeah. take us through this? I'll do the first two and Liz will do the third if that's all right. Lovely, that's, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, the first appeal um, that we've summarised for your benefit, um, we've brought at member's request and it concerns um, the um, Tivoli, um, the cinema in the middle of Wimborne and it the appeal uh, concerned itself with um, some um, remodelling of the uh, new doors um where the um the inner doors or and outer doors were modeled um with stainless steel detailing no door handles but sim simply rectangular push detailing compared with the the, the art deco uh, style that had previously been um present the um the appeal was allowed and the inspector, contrary to the councillors concerned, considered that the silver colour of the fixings and the door furniture made no difference to the way in which the original parts of the facade were perceived. And in his opinion, the colour wasn't incongruous. And as the historic identity, the original building was barely perceptible within the lobby and foyer space that he didn't think there was any impact on the conservation area. Um, the application um, was um, was 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 approved that similarly there was no um, impact uh, considered to the to the listed buildings fabric um, but that's just an interesting appeal we tried to retain the um, the integrity of the art deco features but um, the inspector disagreed with the officer um, assessment um, the second appeal that we've got that we brought to you is because it's um it was a scheme within Ferndown um, where the applicant proposed to demolish existing dwellings and erect three four-storey block of 27 retirement flats. Um, here there were concerns about the, the design of the block, the scale, the form of the block and the impact on both the character of the locality and upon neighbouring amenity. And the inspector agreed with nearly all the reasons for refusal, in fact all the reasons for refusal, and he, um, it, it's just an, an, an interesting example of, um, of local distinctiveness, character and form, and the importance of ensuring that a d large scale development of this kind assimilates and respects the environment in which it's set. And you can see that appeal summary in full on pages um, 86 running into 87. Um, I'll ask um, Liz to um, to take all, over the next item as she was involved. Thank you. The, fi the final appeal was just um, uh, an example of us, uh, the council successfully defending refusal of a certificate of proposed lawfulness for use of an existing caravan site, but proposed for static caravans for residential purposes. Um, we've had a mixed um, sort of um, a mixed bag of decisions, let's say, on caravan sites recently. So this was a good one to um, where the council um, was able to argue that there was a difference between touring and static caravans and the duration of time that they would be on the site. Thank you. Thank you very much for those updates, Liz and Kim. Uh, that brings us to item nine urgent items and members you'll be pleased to know that there aren't any so it just falls to me now to thank everybody for joining us the this morning both from the members of the public councils and officers um, in making it an interesting debate um, apologies for the small lapses in technology i know i dipped out i know david dipped out and one or two others had a bit of a wobble um, let's hope that next time we meet things will be run much more smoothly so thank you all very much and i'll see you next time thank you thank you, thank you, you bye, bye everybody thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.